seven day two. Um, this is a, a, a panel that is really personal to me and very near and dear to my heart uh, because it is about just the arc of samples and, and how much this has changed, the use of samples in production. And the fact that, I mean, I guess we see this all the time outside uh, of music technology, but the rules haven't changed as time has changed. I mean, this has changed so much over the last, uh, like, you know, just thinking it through. I remember starting to use sample library CDs uh, going back to the late 80s when we were starting, you know, just using the S950s and S900s and whatnot. And all of a sudden, these, these CDs started coming out. You could sample a beat and put it in there. And, um, I remember personally, I, uh, I guess I was around 20 or so, I was, I engineered the, the first Nine Inch Nails album. And that was the first time I ever saw somebody use a loop, trying to use a loop. And I thought, yeah, what is he doing? It's a loop. It's like this weird sample flipping around. And then all of a sudden, these sample CDs started coming out. And this became sort of normal, that you loop a little segment of music. But when we would do it, it was something that we, you know, we didn't band underneath the track. It was a little part of a piece of music, right? Or, you know, you to be creative, you cut it up a lot of different ways, and you'd, you'd find some new way to use it that no one had ever used it before, and that was sort of the, the art of it. And, and along with that, you know, hip-hop evolved, and, and sampling, obviously, is most probably equated to hip-hop, right? Because they started sampling popular music. And back in the day, there wasn't even law rules on that. There was law that nobody followed them. And you would just sample whatever you wanted and put it in your record, and then the person would get really pissed, and they'd sue, and you'd figure it out. And that's how it worked. They just figured it all out. Here's Mick. Come on up here, Mick. Join the fun. Oh, yes. How are you guys? We need one more chair. You can take this chair. Let's take this chair. We'll put you right here. I'll come over here. So, essentially, you know, we had this, you know, this rise up of sampling, which, which we all know that as hip-hop started using samples, well, it, it kind of changed the, the purpose of them. In, in, in early record production, you know, our goal was to hide the sample. Like, you chop it all up, make it little, do da 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 figure out a way so that you've never seen it before, and do something really cool with it. So, but ultimately, the evolution of using samples has changed. And hip -hop, when hip hop started happening, it, we started to want to hear the sample all of a sudden. So, and, and all of a sudden, they started to really work out the business of samples. And the business of samples, when you really use them from a published work, is you share the copyright with the person you sampled. Okay, and and. On the inside of that business, typically they dictate the amount of money, what would, not amount of money, the amount of percentage that you share in that copyright. Not you, they do. So when you use a sample in record production, you're, you're for the most part at the whim of the person whose music you sampled. You can take it out, you can recreate it, they'll probably still see But for the most part, you are really at the whim of them to decide how much they want to share, or how, how, really how much they want you to share in the, in the ownership of that music at that point, because your music is contingent on their music. So as time evolved, we, we get to now, okay? So, and in between there, we had a whole bunch of steps in technology. We started to see, you know, one of the first times I think we ever saw it, and it's, it's almost a forgotten, application at this point, but I'll bring it up, was Sonic Foundry with Acid. All, you know, Acid hit the market, and all of a sudden you could grab, it came with all this content. It was a program that came with content. And you'd bring a piece of content in, and you'd drag it as many bars as you wanted it, and the more bars you dragged it, the more it played. And all that content was samples. They're all samples. There's drum samples, there's bass lines, there's piano parts. It's all samples of performed music that somebody played that you're allowed to use without going through any of those challenges that you go through when you sample copywritten music or music that's owned by a record company. So
So we, we always have considered that what we call royalty-free use of content. Well, again, even, even in the time of that, that was when we started to see people really kind of, maybe even the consumer world and non-musicians start to share in that, I'm gonna make music without necessarily playing anything. I can almost paint this thing. Now we all know what Garage Band is, that came later. Garage Band in its early incarnations was very similar to Acid. It was sort of, uh, Acid was only a PC format, so most people didn't really know much about it. Um, then all of a sudden Garage Band hit, it was preloaded on the Mac, and everybody knew what Garage Band was, and Garage Band has evolved and evolved, and now it has all the features of a full-blown DAW in it. So this group of people here is, they are all very interesting to me because they all have to do with this world. And what we've seen now is we're see, we've seen a time when instruments coming preloaded with content have gotten so evolved and so uh, sophisticated that you can hold down a key and hear a piece of music. It, we have so much of this construction kit mentality of, you know, I have a layout of keys and I can hold down three or four things and just by doing that I've made a piece of music. So as that's gotten now to the point where I can sit at night and I can watch television, I can recognize all of those patches. I can sit there and go, that's, you know, evolve, you know, tonal loops, F sharp set, you know, F sharp four, boom, that's what it is, right? And I know it. It's like, that's ridiculous. And, and you can look at these things and say, I know what that is. And, and they're, they're everywhere. Action strings is a good example of it from Native Instruments. So let me first introduce this group of people, tell you a little bit about what they do, and then I'll explain why all this is so important and, and why this is something that I think needs to change. This is Mick Kiley. He is from a company, technically Score Music Interactive, correct? He has a technology show here. I hope you guys got to see it called Exhale. If you didn't, right after this, run and see, but it's a fascinating technology. Mick is a, uh, comes out of video game composition background. He was a video game composer in Ireland, and he has now Exhale, which is a technology that he's doing what I hope the rest of the world will do. He's found a technology that will manipulate pieces of music into being used in productions, and he gives you royalties for it. Am I correct in that? Spot on. Thank you. That's awesome, and I applaud you for that. And, and this is a piece of technology that you're going to see now editors, uh, people using where they can say to themselves, I need a ten I made a piece of tension music. They can, any piece of music they drag in, any file they drag in, map to each other, manipulate itself to fit with all the other pieces of music, and any other stem of music that's in there, which is incredible technology. <coughs> and you can literally turn one MIDI file into a hundred mapped different pieces of what he calls templates in, in a matter of seconds. So, but the difference between what he's doing and what you're, what we saw in the early days of sample <coughs> is the author of that music receives royalties and receives credit. Carmen is here. Carmen is a spectacular producer. He comes out of Nikki, well, he's producer and engineer mixer and everything in between, artist as well, and he is also now in our for Artist Division, Ari Winters from Heaviosity, which is happens to be one of, in my opinion, the most sophisticated and excellent versions of exactly what I'm talking about. The new, the new world of VST technology where what comes out is the work of somebody brilliant, and ultimately this is, I'm gonna ask Ari to explain himself, but this is kind of how the company was formed was they are composers, they were composers, and they decided to do what's sort of my dream, which is to have my own VST so other people can score with my music. And ultimately, if I'm correct, that's sort of what Heavy Austin was born out of and has evolved, if you will, not to make fun, but uh, evolved into, into a whole different product line, all functioning off that same format. And in the world of film and television composition, their tools are very powerful tools used by, you know, left and right, and I'll say the same for Carmen. These guys make two of the product lines that you don't live without. I mean, you, you just can't live without. Um, 
Perry Geyer is a very old friend of mine. We go back 25 years in, in the production world. He was in a band called Manufacture when I was first starting out, and we worked together back then. Perry has actually authored many of the CD libraries that I'm talking about when I say we used to chop these things up. We tied them tighter, take them to the snare head, and then we tied them underneath. Perry was actually on the forefront of, of authoring those things in the world of not receiving royalties for all that work. <laughs> um, and, and when I spoke to him about this, it was you know something that we chatted about a bit because it's it's a big deal. I, I'm my background is come from record production, but I live in Hollywood <coughs> and I'm a television composer. So I am I have the luxury of having of being part of the the royalty system of every time your music plays on television, you collect money. So this is something that's very near and dear to my heart is to try and figure out how to do what Mick's doing for people that do what Ari's company does, for people that do what any of, like, what Native Instruments does, what any of these companies, because what's happening now is we're building tools that are so sophisticated and so musical that we're, we're allowing people to create music with content that's being shipped with the instrument, okay? And if you model this back now to what we talked about a minute ago with hip-hop music, when I use a sample in a hip-hop record, they dictated to me how much of that piece of music they owned. I had no say in it. But now in the modern world, I'm able to buy a piece of equipment, I'll call it a piece of equipment, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an application, if you will. It comes with, in, you know, sometimes now 30, 60 gigs of content that come with these things. <coughs> content that you can just write music forever with. And the person who sat with me at all So if, if that record wins a Grammy and the whole thing is based on holding down one key from something that somebody else made and you just sang over it, they have no credit. They have no Grammy. They have no royalties when it plays on the radio. They just have what they get in the beginning. Now, I personally feel like it's time. We, we've hit a place where this has been happening so long and these tools are so sophisticated that I think it's time to change that. I think it's time, if you know, if you were there for the opening keynote, I said that one of the one of the great people on that opening keynote panel on AI said to me at lunch, I asked him what was gonna happen to musicians with all this AI technology, and he said, well, we'll always need the greatest musicians, and we'll always hire them to teach the machines. And that was a fascinating, you know, thing to hear him say. And I was really like, oh, wow, that's intense. Um, but if we look at that and we say, okay, that's the CEO of one of the biggest companies in music technology, and all he's saying that sounds so nuts is exactly what's already happening. We are teaching the machine. We are, somebody is making this music. Somebody is making these beautiful soundscapes and these rich layers of parts that are all going. And in fact, we even have endorsed products where, you know, you've got people like Rupert Gregson Williams working on things, right? And Bill Brown and people like that. I mean, you different company than you. I, you know, I have so many folders of them, but, sure. but, the, but that's, uh, that's uh, Synergy there. And, but you, you're seeing top composers creating this music that you can buy from these things. Mm -hmm. So what I want to talk about is how can we figure out a way to track and involve the people who create this? So companies like Native Instruments, Companies like Heaviosity, people like Perry, can bring the best musicians in the world. If this is what it's going to change to, I want them to be able to bring the best musicians in the world in, have them work on content for them, and have those musicians continue to be rewarded with what's due to them, which is credit and royalties. Because we are in a different time period right now where this is important. So I've introduced everybody, and I'll get to you one second. I just want to also introduce Daniel Harris. Daniel Harris comes from Kendra. And he has a, a, something called the Kendra Initiative. It, Kendra is a, an open source technology. He's from just outside of London. And the reason I brought uh, Daniel here is because he's going to show you a technology that is the starting point to be able to say, wait a minute, this can be tracked. This can be done. So first we take a couple questions. Then I'm going to have Daniel show that. And then we can talk about it. And I'm sorry for the long-winded introduction, but this is a pretty intense topic, and I thought it, I think it's good.
good to kind of lay out what it is. So uh, why don't we start with Perry? Tell us just to give us a couple minutes about yourself and sure. your background, and we'll go across, and then I'm going to have Daniel come and do that. Um, well, thanks, Doug, first of all, for inviting me to be on your panel. Oh, this is fantastic, and I think the congratulations on the conference. Thank you. This is great. Uh, so my name is Perry Geyer. Uh, I own Cybersound Recording Studios. We're a music uh, production and sound design company. We're located right here in Boston, right on Newberry Street. Um, so, and I create music, you know, one of my jobs is creating music for sample libraries and uh, TV shows and, um, you know, and music or audio books, whatever that is. Um, I created about 10 sample CDs and music libraries for uh, Big Fish, East West, Universal mm -hmm. Publishing. Um, the latest loop, loop based release, I think, is called uh, Well, here's some of them actually. Actual uh, Hypnotica. It's <coughs> Hypnotica years ago. Um, that was Spy, I got Oh, you had one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah, did that. Yeah, oh, that was the one. Okay. Nice. Yeah, this is back when we would <coughs> grab little snips. And exactly. Make it happen. But um, what was interesting, and I'll, I'll be really short, because I'm not a great speaker anyway, but, um, you know, the background to do the sample libraries is, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, what I would do is I would take a nominal recorder, and I'd go to whatever, you know, back then, industrial music was the big thing, so I'd go to construction sites and sample, you know, sample things from construction sites, you know, with a novel recorder, mm -hmm. and put them into a, you know, mobile sample and create, you know, beats with that. So, you know, I know you brought that up, you know, mm -hmm. in early sure. days of sampling, which is cool. But, um, so basically, you know, you know, I'm all, I'm all for musicians who create the content, um, for musicians, musicians who created the content to get paid and credited mm -hmm. for their music, I'm yes. so sure. And the 
concept. So for me, it's sort of come full circle. You know, I mean, like you had mentioned back when, there, there were primitive tools then, and it was more of the art of sampling, of taking records, whether it's vinyl or whatever the source is, and chopping it up and creating it. And, and some wonderful things have come to that. I mean, that's how hip hop was born, almost. You know, <clears throat> so to me, that's a positive thing. So I look at that as inspiration. On the negative side, sure, people were getting paid, and back then you couldn't even like sample a two bar loop without getting you know, handcuffed or something. But now uh, it's almost easier because I think one, it's like the Wild West in, in the sense of sampling pre recorded music, I think it's almost easier. But on, in, in the same breath, there's companies like ours that make the tools so easy. Saying that, yes, we've all heard presets that are on records or shows, which is almost embarrassing that they're like, you're kidding. But um, they're tools. And I think that if you are hopefully a respectful composer or musician or, or artist, you're either not a preset guy or you pride yourself on not using those things. Mm -hmm. But people are getting paid, actually. And I think now, and I'm seeing it from Native Instruments, the phone calls I get on a daily basis of people begging on their hands and knees to do a sample library under the NI. And whether they do it on their own, but they want, because someone like an I or countless others perhaps, you know, these guys are making a lot of money. I know some artists that are making more on royalties from sound libraries than they are on And that's in the, in the mechanical license for... Yeah, because for at the them. end of the day, they're still getting paid. They're just not getting paid as much. If I hire great musicians to, like, do loops and do things, I'm paying them. They're mm -hmm. not getting royalty. It's a session work. Um, I'm getting the sale, me, I'm just saying, whoever does it gets the sales, but at least they are paying it. But I think it's changed where you could have a signature sound, and whether it's drum sounds or something, then sell that as a kit or an instrument, and you'd be surprised. I mean, NI does a great job of selling inexpensive, like, if you're familiar with, like, Machine, we use that. The sounds are so good, they're almost too good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's embarrassing, and I'm really not saying this from the NI, because I mean, I, I use the products like, like all of you, but it's like, it's embarrassing how some of the manufacturers have such shitty sounds, mm -hmm. when some of the others have such great sounds, and they give you MIDI, and they give you sequence, and you hit play, whether it's a loop or whether it's a sequence, you're like, what the hell, I mean, this is a bloody song, you know? So, again, I think it's a tool, and I think it's how you use it, but I, just to end it, I, I think it is a positive thing that now I'm seeing a switch where artists are branding their sound. So hopefully they might not be getting royalties in the conventional way, but they're getting paid something. Okay. Uh, hi, yeah, my name is Kylie. Um, I'm still uh, explaining I'm the CEO of um, a company called School Music Interactive based in Ireland. Founder of a technology we call Exhale. And uh, um, basically, we found a way to allow composers and musicians to uh, collaborate. Uh, we, we found a way to show them how to give us content that becomes interactive. And that basically means that we can now remodel the production music library world to the sense in that we can now give uh, the users an option to. Uh, generate and license unique music that is unique to their project to their project while all the content rem remains circulating in the cloud and is, is used over and over again in other form related combinations if that makes sense. And then we divide the the licensing fee between the composer to the parts who retain the publishing um, part of it. That's basically the a very quick elevator pitch to our tech and what we do. What I've, something that I've learned while being here at uh, uh, A3E, and I want to again uh, say congratulations to Doug. I think this is a fantastic uh, conference and something that's, uh, that the industry needs, and look forward to seeing it grow over the years. One thing that becomes very apparent to me here is that there's a lot of new thinking and technology. We're definitely on the cusp of something very new and exciting for our industry, and you can see a lot of sy synchronicities in a lot of the companies and the products here. And so there's a new thinking from, coming our way, and we're all part of that. But I think as, you know, as pioneers of something
something definitely very new that's happening. We have a responsibility to, 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 uh, to set an example. Because one thing I've learned over the years with technology, technology is no use without creatives behind it. So when we use Pro Tools, Logic, or any, any awesome technologies that allow the creation of great music, it's actually not that great unless it's in the hands of those creative people. So people that will come after us to use creative tools that we make, we need to set example, and that's why it's really important for us that we keep revenue circulating in the hands of the people that make music, musicians and composers. Because the day, that's, the day that stops, it's going to be a very sad day for the industry, and we want, it's not something that, that we want to certainly see happen. So, you know, it's like filmmakers will only make films as long as people want them to make films, People will only make music as long as that they can, you know, that they can make music and you know get get a, earn a living from it. So it's really uh, it's really important um, to see that that revenues return to sample-based music. Um, that's something that we're very passionate about. Here. So what I'd like to do is uh, this is our, our our developers conference and not uh, you too. So I want to be sensitive to that and and look at this from a, a bit of the inside out right now because I I hear everything and I, and I understand what you're saying. And I want to just say before I bring Daniel on and, and to show you something. Um, I'm, a, I'm as, I mean, for those of you who don't know, I'm one of the founders of this event. I, I'm very much thinking over the next five years, where is this going? What's happening? What are we doing? And what I'm seeing as a trend is, and I think it's crystal clear as a trend, is that we are grow, we, we are a, an industry now that wants to say everybody can be creative, everybody can make music, and we're going to put the tools right in your hand to do it. And as the as the audio developers, we're the people that are designing those tools, we're the people creating those tools, and building those tools. So. To me, there's nobody more important to talk to than get right to the bottom of who are those people. And that's why I wanted to have you all here to, to, to connect with artists and talk about this. So my feeling is that what we're going to see continue as a trend over these next few years is very inexpensive tools delivered to very, you know, people that are not musicians that, and, and I want to just take one second and say, that I, and I've said this many times in this conference already. Just because somebody's not a musician doesn't mean they, they might not be the best musician on the planet. They may have never been exposed to music. They may have never had an instrument. They may have never taken a music lesson. And that tool that lands in their hand might wind up being the first thing that shows them that they're an absolute genius musician and they can do incredible things with something. That said, it's also going to land in the hands of, you know, tons of people who are just using it for fun, making content, and we're going to see the internet, and YouTube, and all of these things that be filled with content that's coming out of every, the everyman creating music and creating content. It's a big part of what we're seeing in all these applications. So when I look at something like machine, these kind of things, these are sophisticated tools that are still pretty much being used by music makers. And what I'm looking at is those tools that are now really being laid into the hands of everybody in an app store that are being delivered right to an iPhone and all of a sudden everybody's able to make music at, at will. And maybe that music is just as simple as saying, music bed, and now I sing over it. Well, where's that music bed come from? What is that? And, and are we gonna ever kind of ground things back to where, where did all this content come from? And if we're not gonna, we may not even have television in five years as a medium to collect royalties, it may be all YouTube, and if there's no content, there's no way to track content and follow who made what. There's no way to ever say, even if we get away from monetarily, if we just talk about archiving it in concept of who made it, who made this? I mean, we look back, you know, Jack Joseph Quick said something brilliant today. He said, it will all change the day somebody makes an enormous hit record on an iPhone. Everybody's going to want that sound. There's going to be plugins that are, you know, the, trying to model the sound of the, of the original 3GS microphone, you know. 
And he's right. He's not wrong. He's absolutely right. That's how our world works. So what, what I see is I see, um, you know, when you look back at Frank Sinatra albums and this whole, these all these different eras, the 70s and rock, the 80s and electronic music, and you, this person played on this and that person played on that and that was the guy, that session musician, and that's the guy who did this. We already kind of lost that with sample libraries. And if we keep going in that direction, we won't know what it is at all. Yeah, but I don't know if that's, just to play devil's advocate, I agree with what you're saying, but, and we had talked about this with Daniel earlier about, I think that's part of the problem. It's, it's, it's moving so fast that who's creating is getting lost. Where you don't know, it's not about hitting F sharp, it's about like, I don't know who played the drums or the piano or the right. produced it. There's zero credits because music is moving so fast. It's like, as an artist, you have to put out music all the time, and there's so much competition, and there's no credits. Yeah. Well, it's part of the digital world. So yeah. I want to introduce Daniel Harris to you, and I want him oh. to, uh, I, I say to you, I want you to, to come up and talk a little bit sure. about yourself and talk a yeah. little about this technology for five minutes. So we kind of look at what your organization's about. And, and again, I want to say, Daniel, this is an open source technology, and that's why we're doing it in this room. I, would, I want to encourage you to meet with afterwards and talk about this and see if this is something you want to get involved with. And then I'll bring that back and we'll talk with the panel about what Just a bit of a precursor to, to the demonstration that I'm going to give you. Uh, in the mid-90s, I set up an internet service provider and um, part of the job of our ISP was to connect to other ISPs because that's how the internet works. And the fun thing about it was it was really easy to do that because there's this protocol called TCP IP, and when you plug in your wire into this, this, this internet exchange, it just interconnects with every other ISP connecting in there as well. So it was a beautiful thing to be part of and creating the internet. Um, it was around the start of the 2000s that I set up this initiative called uh, Kent Initiative, and um, just to follow up with what Mick was saying, but. Uh, what that is about is about driving revenue to content creators and content owners. And we've been looking at various different ways about how we can actually help assist, what can te technology do to really create an environment where, where people can get rewarded for the art that they create. And recently we've been looking at rights and credits and royalties within within the uh, the music industry. And I should say that we're not trying to change anything. We're just trying to provide some glue. In fact, all the pieces are out there. Everyone is doing a sterling job of, of making music and collecting royalties. But there are gaps, and it's about the gaps, it's about filling in the gaps and providing more freedom, um, freedom of information uh, for the people um, involved. So we're creating. Uh, why I talked about internet providers was what, what we would like to see is a world where every app can talk to every other app and every service provider can talk to every other service, service provider and exchange information about royalties, exchange information about credits and it's slick and easy as connecting an ethernet into your, or connecting to a wireless because no one uses ethernet anymore. So it just works. And the benefits of doing that is I can drag one song that I created over in Pro Tools, whack it into, an, uh, take a sample of it, whack it into some, some other device, just like MIDI, actually. You know, MIDI works in a different environment. MIDI works, MIDI, you can connect all these different um, instruments together, and that's another protocol, and it just works. But there's a lot of infrastructure, there's a lot of work that has to go into creating a protocol. So I'm going to give you a quick demo, am I? of a very early stage prototype that we're working on. It's um, part funded by the UK government. And that doesn't look. Okay, right. So, and what we're doing is we're, we're 
um, creating some ideas about So I'm going to show you a very early stage model about, and it is basically we're just modeling a rights end-to-end -end protocol and what that might mean. So we're coming at it from very much a technological standpoint and a mathematical standpoint. But, and why we're here is because we want to hear from artists about actually where are the pain points and managers and producers. What, you know, Um, so, this is something called Kendall, and we're, we're building an application that will um, enable us to model this, this environment because nothing talks protocols, no, no applications talk protocols outside of their own um, rights or um, credit protocols outside of their own environment. There's lots of applications and services that are doing a really great job internally of mon uh, monitoring and, and um, uh, storing rights information about the assets that they, that they uh, hold and, and that their users develop. But in terms of exchanging that information with other, other um, uh, environments, other services, it, 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 there's not much out there. So that's why we're creating this. This hub. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take a song and I'm going to, um, we've modeled Stairway to Heaven. In an ideal world, what will happen is that you'll take your multi-track mix of Stairway to Heaven and um, what you can see here is we kind of modeled a timeline of, of samples and um, artists and what they've been playing and um, their contribution to the song. So you see this a lot in, in um, Brahms and a lot in multi-track environments. It's very sim we've simplified it a lot um, and the ideal scenario would be you just export it from Pro Tools or whatever door that you're using as XML and um, currently that's not possible because they don't have metadata within the doors. But Pro Tools have started to demonstrate um, a, a metadata-enabled Pro Tools. So um, that's why Abbott have demonstrated that. So that's interesting that, that, that manufacturers are moving this in this direction anyway. But they're obviously they're not yet there yet. So we're having to model it outside of that environment. So here's a song. We've got um, composition rights. We've got performance rights, as you can see there. And um, here's the split between, between the rights. And what we want to do is create a protocol that will allow the, the people involved in the production to decide what the split should be. A lot of the time, it's, it's, it's dictated by rules of a particular country uh, and the collection societies within the country. And that's fine and that's OK. We want to be able to model that as well. But we also want to provide flexibility. The, the, the rights can be split in any way. And it's up to the, obviously, the, the all parties concerned to, to dictate what those splits should be. So, let's go to a new song. Let's, there's one here that's acceptable. It's song one. Okay, this is a song that, with David Bowie and Freddie Mercury in it, they just happen to do a little jam together sometimes. Okay, this didn't, didn't happen. This we're just playing now. And this this is a split between if some you know this is if a, if a dollar came in, then then Freddie would get 43 cents and, and David would get 57, for example. Let's embed a sample of Stairway to Heaven in here. Let's so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag these sliders in and take a sample of Stairway to Heaven. 
Again, I must stress that you wouldn't be doing this. You would just take a sample within Pro Tools and drag it into some other environment. This, you would not see the system. We're just using this to model the environment because it doesn't exist at the moment. And so I need to explain it like this. It helps if I've got a graphical representation, right? So what you can see is that actually a lot of those samples have, are now not even being displayed. And what we're even doing, which I'm sure a lot of people won't, will, will balk against, is that we're actually suggesting a certain split between, <coughs> between the people actually performing with, within that sample. So for example, if I, if I go and take more of the track, then there's more elements being displayed there, and the suggested split is a lot more complex as it's actually taking into account the amount of time you spent playing your track, playing in that particular sample. So let me take um, the, another, uh, just, just this sample here, and I'm going to embed that within the song too. And then I state how much of that, how much of that I actually use, because I could obviously loop it. 